Last year, the General Assembly passed House Bill 76, Access to Healthcare Options, that expanded Medicaid eligibility to an estimated 600,000 North Carolinians. In the first seven weeks of enrollment, over 341,000 residents have been enrolled, with some of the biggest increases happening in our poorest areas of the state. To help us understand how this was possible to achieve, we have two legislators, one from each party, who were very involved in making Medicaid expansion a reality in our state. Republican Representative Stephen Ross of Alamance County is a full-time financial advisor and one of the co-sponsors of House Bill 76. Democratic Senator Sidney Batch is an attorney from Wake County and has been a long-term supporter of Medicaid expansion. We are so glad both could join us this afternoon. To moderate our policy conversation, we have longtime award-winning journalist David Crabtree, CEO of PBS North Carolina. Please welcome our panel to the stage. And David, I'll turn it over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here for this session after a very long day that's been focused on financial resilience. So, Representative, Senator, thank you for being here for the, this conversation. Uh, we're going to start with a roadmap to financial resilience that's been guiding this event today. This roadmap says four things that are important to building high levels of financial resilience. Uh, the first is routinely positive cash flow, because we all know if we don't have any money at the end of the month, you simply cannot save. And I'm willing to bet everybody in this room has been there at some point in their life. Personal resources, emergency savings in particular. Few of us can save enough to handle the truly big financial emergencies, so should we save for the smaller ones? Access to quality benefits, and finally, financial know-how, a combination of the skills and knowledge and a demonstrated ability to effectively use them. Too many of us, have never had any financial training and too often learn the hard way, which can be very personal and very painful. So I wanna start with this. We know where we are with Medicaid expansion. That has happened after many years and already you were telling me backstage, Representative, that we have hit a point with financial costs, healthcare costs rather, that are already rocking the Medicaid boat? Well, I think the, uh, what I was trying to uh, get at in that conversation was the fact that healthcare costs are rising so fast that you know, we've expanded Medicaid, we've brought a whole new group of, of citizens into uh, the roles, uh, but that has not stopped the cost going up for all. Um, it's, it's rising faster than anything else in inflation. Uh, and if you look at premiums and then you look at what employers have to pay, uh, th there's a tremendous increase there that continues year after year. Uh, in addition to that, the portion that many uh, of our employees uh, have to pay, uh, whether it's co-insurance or co-pays, that continues to go up. So it won't be long and it, to, to me before we're in another situation where another whole group of people will not be able to afford the co-pays and the co-insurance. Employers won't be able to afford the premiums. It's, it's, a, it's just spiraling out of control. Senator, you have a lot of young people working for you. Right. Yeah. Uh, you are a young person, by the way, but <laughs> even younger than you. And you were telling me that their comprehension at times of understanding what a benefit, the benefit is, can right. be difficult. Yeah, so, you know, as a small business owner, I don't have, thank God we can do group plans, right? And I can take the benefit of, of working to just have, there, there are 10 of us. And so when we're looking at plans, again, we're trying to negotiate the amount of money that, that we can pay and what's affordable. What I have found, and in, in large part, it's because it's value-based for our firm, is that we pay 100% of the insurance premiums for our employees, but that comes with a cost. Uh, we have less turnover, so that is naturally a benefit. 
but it also is more expensive than our rent, right? So we spend over $7,200 for that many people in our, in our firm every single month. And what we also found is that, especially with the younger, um, with, with some younger employees, they don't know what your premium actually is. So a couple of years ago, I started actually giving them at the end of the year when we're going over their evaluation and how much they pay, I also show them how much we're paying in their insurance premiums, we're paying in disability, we're paying in their dental and their eye, we're paying with you know, vacation that they have and the sick leave, et cetera, because they can now conceptualize what it actually means to employ somebody. And they can see the benefits of $740 is not going out of my pocket every month as an employee that I would have to figure out how to make up on the end. It's actually my employer paying it. And so I do think that it is sustainable it's diff I mean, we, we put less money in our pockets as a firm, but we also feel like it's really important to, of course, reward our employees for the sweat equity. And it's hard when you have some smaller businesses that don't have that ability, right? And we were talking about this, to be able to do that because premiums are high and we've seen them increase time and time again. And so it's really a balance with regards to businesses and then also trying to, of course, tell employees, hey, this is the value. And many of them, I think, are now starting to appreciate that when they come from jobs that don't actually insure them at all. Medicaid expansion. How many years did I read those headlines and stories about the push for Medicaid expansion, the fact that it didn't happen? It was politically charged out of the gate. Uh, it has happened, but let's go back in time. Why do you think it was so politically charged from the beginning? Representative? I think there were a lot of uh, misunderstandings about how the whole system worked. Um, that's one issue. Uh, I, there were parts of it I never totally understood because I worked on the original bill that we started back, gosh, I guess maybe over six years ago, uh, called Carolina Cares. Uh, and we actually got that bill all the way to the House floor uh, for a vote, but then it was pulled because at that point in time, they said the Senate would not uh, go along with it. Um, so it's, it's been a long struggle. It's been years in, in the making, um, and just different issues, uh, but mostly, in my opinion, misunderstanding about what actually happens, how this process works, and it's very, it is very complicated. I know that uh, Representative Lambeth worked very hard on this. Uh, he's considered the champion of, of the expansion, uh, and as you know, he was, he was the, uh, administrator of, of a hospital, Wake Forest Baptist, and that's, that's a large hospital. Uh, he had a great working knowledge, but trying to get the masses to understand how all of that nuts and bolts of it worked was difficult. Well, the masses would say, there's 600,000 people, they could be helped by this, why not do it? Mm -hmm. Is that what you heard from a lot of constituents? Yes, and I also think that it also, when you put into context who you're helping, right, in that coverage gap. Very little people know about how much it costs or the individuals that actually be covered by the, Medi the, the uh, Medicaid expansion in the gap. And so when you actually put a price tag on it and how much money these working families, you know, made every single month and at the end of the day, especially with the rising costs, even, and especially with regards to housing, et cetera, you didn't have enough. So you had to make really hard decisions. So when they found out it was, oh, these are people that make $31,000 a year. These aren't people that are just sitting down and they're lazy and they just wanna collect a government check. They're individuals who were going without care and were dying. Then it made sense. I think there was a fiscal argument at that point, especially in rural areas and large swaths of North Carolina that just saw hospitals close time and time again. Constituents who weren't able to go ahead and get cancer treatments in their backyard or any type of medical treatment for that matter. We still have 61 counties in North Carolina that don't have psychiatrists and we have a mental health crisis. So when you see time and time again, all of these areas and constituents across the state not getting the benefits and the help that they need, you find yourself in a position where at some point there's a breaking point and we need to go ahead and bring it in. And so while you know, I say it was a decade too long, um, I'm happy that you know, we are finally here and now we can address how we fix the medical system because again, Medicaid expansion isn't necessarily going to be the magic cure for, for lowering the cost of somebody having to get a CT scan. The, the two of you are known to work well together. Yep. Opposing parties working together, bipartisanship. Um, were there times during these negotiations that it was really tough that you wanted to walk out of the room 
walk away from the table? I mean, for me, no, but that's also because, you know, in my day job, I'm a family law attorney and I do child welfare law. So I deal with diametrically opposed people every day fighting over their money and their children. <laughs> and if y'all ever want to see people, and if any of you have divorced, you know what I mean, in that I have dealt with the most emotionally charged issues over the last 18 years. And so sometimes it's, you know, when I, when I first started running, a, a, a young, um, an older woman said, I don't know how you're going to handle it down there at that legislature. And I said, I literally am a divorce attorney. I can handle the legislature. And so I think in a lot of ways, it's just a different playground. Um, and you just have to realize that as an attorney, it's about compromise. And you know, I'm a litigator, but I, but I settle 95% of my cases because I believe a good government means that you sit at the table and that no one walks away from the table without getting something and without having to give something up. Uh, Representative, you are a mayor, so you know how to negotiate. Were there really difficult times in pushing this through? It was a long, like I said, it was a long process. So I would say, yes, it was difficult. I, I was never one that, that wanted to walk away from it at all because I work in finance. I work with families uh, trying to help, uh, you know, uh, plan for the future. And one of the things that we did toward the end was we started bringing some families in and having some testimony of what it was actually costing them. And you would have a family of four come in with a $2,600 premium just for health care, basic health care. Um, and so people on the, on the different committees would look at that and say, well, you know what, I don't think I could handle a $2,600 premium. And most people couldn't. And so the real life stories that started coming in, it's like, this is what we're facing. This is what we're up against. Um, and I think once many of the members started to see the real life stories, what, what it was doing to families, taking their entire budget, if they even had health care, uh, and then the, the mood started to change. Uh, these complicated issues are never as simple as uh, sometimes we in the media want to make them because headlines are a lot easier to write about than context and the complications. With that in mind, let's pivot to uh, something that's been discussed today, the roles and responsibilities for individuals, for government, and the private sector. That's a lot to reconcile. How do you do it? Who, who bears the most responsibility? I mean, I think that, it, in my opinion, is I think we can do hard things, right? And I don't think that it's an either or, it's an and. Uh, and there are some areas in which we need state involvement, much more so like DOT and transportation, than we may need in other areas like healthcare, right? So I think we just need to look globally at how we can partner better from our local municipalities, from the state government, from the private sector and the public sector, because a lot of times we are actually just frustrating efforts instead of sitting down and talking to one another and saying, what are you good at? And taking ideas and best practices and actually using that, right? So I'll give you the health insurance uh, industry. There are many, especially in health insurance companies, who will say, I'm not going to give you my proprietary information and I'm not going to tell you how we're going to negotiate for this person and you have to go through this entire litany to go ahead and be, on, be paneled with the, with the five different providers. Well, at the end of the day, if we could actually get best practices, we'd have better outcome. But there's a lot of competition, which is necessary with regards to business and people making a profit, that it's hard to sometimes get outside of yourself and then look at the bigger picture. And I think we need to have more collaborative efforts with both, both local and public and private sector and then the state government for us to actually work smarter, not harder with what we're doing and how we're spending our resources because they are ultimately limited. Representative? I think if you look at it, it's really, there's no one answer, uh, whether it's personal, you know, or public, uh, or employer. Uh, it's a combination. Um, I think if you are an employer of a, of a company of a certain size and above, I think it's really a, a sort of a responsibility of that company to provide benefits. Um, and in the past, a lot of companies have done that, although now with cost, you're seeing more companies kind of back away from it. Um, the role of government, and I can give you an example, we have a bill now that's in the House uh, that's called the Work and Save Act, because employers, there's a certain cost uh, barrier to providing benefits uh, when it becomes too expensive to provide a 401k, for example, or other retirement savings. Um, 
they just don't do it or they don't match. And so the Work and Save Act is, is a, a plan uh, that we've put together that, that creates a savings plan within small employers uh, where they can have payroll withholding. Uh, that's, we found that if you have payroll withholding of, uh, of a savings, that more people will do it. And it's, in fact, studies have shown as, as many as 75 to 80 percent of the employees will take advantage of that if it's, if it's provided and it's, it's in a method of payroll deduction. Um, without the payroll deduction, studies have shown they just don't do it. Um, but because of the cost, most employers don't offer that. So we're looking at a method, uh, working with some other organizations to create something very similar to uh, uh, some of the state retirement plans that are just for small savings, for people to accumulate money in small savings. It's, it's a little bit complicated because we're, we're really struggling to try to figure out where to put it, who's going to run it. Um, but that is kind of all those, the, the, the process of putting all that together is ongoing right now. And it's, uh, it's actually in a bill uh, that we've introduced uh, to try to create a savings plan, uh, you know, for small employers or even individuals. Um, it's... That, that, that's kind of an example of a role that government could play in trying, recognizing the fact that we've got a, uh, a population that's growing, we have a, a large number of that population that doesn't save because they don't have the opportunity, and this is a way of bringing it down to a level where we can try to get more people to save. And he's absolutely right, because even with our firm, we have a 401k, but we have to spend a lot of money on a small number of employees to do that, and we do a 3%, just automatic safe harbor. But then mm. when they realize that it's three, and then they understand compounding interest, and then we just pay for, their for the financial advisor to come in and advise them before they even sign up for the plan about what makes sense and what their retirement goals are, they have a very different understanding about what the value is in, in actually um, putting that forward. But to your point, it's not without cost. And it's very difficult for most employers to actually go ahead and bear that cost. So I love that idea. You know, I'm just thinking about uh, people who want to save, as you've talked about, and maybe they don't have the opportunity to save. And that butts up against a society that says spend, buy a new car, lease a new car, buy a new house, clothing, college education. The list goes on and on and on and on. So is there a role for government to say, we understand that, however, we really want to step in and educate you even more so of why this is so essential. If you're looking for resilience, mm -hmm. you have to be able to rein in what you're doing. I think we've done it um, in two really great ways with the legislature, and, and again, there's a lot of classes and opportunities kids can uh, can have, but we did do the financial like the, the financial course that the kids have to, to take now to graduate, which is important because most kids don't understand how to write a check, right? I mean, heck, most kids don't Checks? actually right. <laughs> yeah, they don't actually have a signature. I was like, y'all, why are we teaching cursive? Pretty sure we need to know how you don't print your name. You actually should have a signature. But um, needless to say, that they can understand where the finances are and, and what it means, right? So a lot of kids may not get a job, but that doesn't mean that you don't teach them that. I think the other thing that we, we have done um, well in at least um, with CFNC and, and college funds is that you can go on there and see what is the average job and how much will it make and then how much is it going to cost for your, you know, degree at all of these different schools so that kids can really start understanding what the value is of the degree that they're going to get and then how much they will likely p get paid with whatever their profession that they choose. There's also a calculator that will tell you exactly what a certain institution will cost you to go there. Uh, we use that one all the time. Um, and I think if you can match the cost of that institution to the job that you're trying to get into, sometimes you can see there's too much disparity. Right. Uh, but, you know, I, I think we have to look at incorporating in the education part of, of financial resiliency that, you know, we, we live in a society where it's, it's buy now, pay later. I mean, that's all you hear. Uh, advertising is constantly, you gotta have it now. 
You can have it now. You know, in fact, I would say that and to some degree, the, the advertising is stacked against us because they make it look so good. Oh, you can have it now, you know. What they don't tell you is, yeah, but you've got to pay for it later. And I think somewhere in our training, we've got to, we've got to teach that now, you know, sometimes it's better to push back. You don't have to have it now. Uh, what's the old saying that they used to? That you've got needs and, and wants. You've got things you need. But then you got things you want, and um, push push back on that. I think there's some way we've got to figure out how to get that into our financial education. You know, uh, we're talking about things in reality here, but oftentimes these issues of looking of how to become financially resilient, how to save, how to prepare for the future when you don't know what the future is going to be, legislation, all of these things are talked about so many times in the abstract not in the hardcore reality of how you do it. I want to go back to the, the Medicaid expansion for a moment. Again, with the political chargeness that came with this legislation, the two of you opted to lead on this. That could have been a risk. Why did you choose to lead on this, Representative? Well, there are a number of factors. Um, one, I understood the finance part of it. I understood how it worked. Uh, but second, uh, I, I took time to listen to some of the families that were caught in the gap, some of the families that could not afford the $2,600 a month for the, for the premium. I put myself in their shoes. And I Did said, they change your mind? I, you know, my mind was already made up when I started because, like I said, I understood the facts. But okay. That really solidified what I what I knew was the right thing to do. Uh, I couldn't do twenty six hundred dollars a month myself, so it was easy to put myself in the shoes of, you know, some of the families that you talk to. And there's so many like, there's stories you could just, we could go all day, you know, on the many stories of the families that what they were facing, and uh, you know, so. Trying to get that through to 170 uh, members uh, it was, was just difficult. Senator, you grew up in a household where medicine was around you all the time, both your parents, right. uh, physicians. Did, and from a position of caring for the community. How much did that impact your leadership on this? I mean, very much so. It, it's interesting because they're also small business owners. So I had the benefit very early on and understanding and being raised in a, in a family with entrepreneurs who also had a, a, a service that they were planning to provide. You know, my dad had the first um, urgent care center in Southeast Raleigh providing for a community that was always isolated and ignored. My mother was one of the OBGYNs that went through, um, who it was a public health doctor and would drive across the state and represent and care for, for women um, and people across the state. And so it was always ingrained in us to, it's always the right time to do the right thing the right thing, right? And so we, I just knew that from a moral standpoint. I also, you know, got my master's in social work, so I understood the multiple issues about marginalized communities and how you try and make sure that if we actually, if we take care of the uh, the average person and everybody else, right, uh, uh, you know, will be, um, will do well and everybody will be successful. And so it was never hard for me. I think the challenge is when you are in a situation where you are working with a lot of individuals who may not have those personal experiences, right, of sitting in um, radiation, like when I was going through um, radiation treatment for my, for my cancer, I sat with women who were from across the state who did not have a hospital and could not get radiation, who had to get on a waiting list for the Ronald McDonald House. When you talk to those individuals who have absolutely no access, and I'm sitting here with a ridiculous amount of privilege, there are only 170 of us in the state that can stand on that floor and we can debate and we can, of course, bring and, and give rise to the attention of stories like the women that I um, receive treatment with. So I think that that is probably the biggest motivator outside of the amount of rural hospitals that continue to close because those women live in places where they would not otherwise be able to have access. And I am a firm believer that if we have a healthy society, then we will obviously have a healthy and more productive individuals and that people, when they do get sick, should be able to, of course, uh, be cared for and to do that in the comfort of their own home instead of you know, 120 miles down the road when they go to UNC. 
Governing is tough, granular, and gritty work, is it not? It is. We See, this is what I would say. <laughs> there are two types, some, some of you might have heard me say this. There are two types, in my opinion, of politicians. They're peacocks and peahens. The peacocks want to show you what they've done and want to take credit for everything and say, look at me, I'm pretty. And then the peahens are just behind the scenes getting the work done. Representative Ross and I are peahens. You don't see us out there at every single press conference. You don't see us going ahead and lobbing Molotov cocktails on Twitter at people. Um, you don't see us engaging in really nasty debates. We believe that there's civility in government and that we should actually be civil to one another. And so I think that if we had more of us in the legislature, we probably would get more done. That's just my premise. I like that, peacocks and peahens. Uh, it, is, it is tough work with expectations <laughs> through the roof of people, right? Yeah. yeah, I've been called a lot of things, never a peanut. <laughs> <laughs> peahen, you're a peahen. Um, <laughs> she's absolutely right though. 95% uh, of what happens is done through relationships off the floor. Uh, when, you, when you start with a, a concept, an idea, you constantly go and you work with different individuals in the legislature, and there are some that are great to work with, no matter which party they are. They'll sit down uh, and sometimes offer suggestions, and you know you just work it until you get it where it needs to be. Um, and I love working with you know whether it's the the opposition side or my side. I love working with people that are just willing to sit down and try to solve problems, because there are not many of those. Uh, you know, you mentioned I was a mayor. As a mayor, you learn how to solve problems in a community. And, and the legislature is just, it's a bigger community. And, um, you know, if everybody could go in there with the attitude, we're going to solve problems, we could get a lot done. It's just unfortunate that you have some that are not willing negotiators sometimes. You know, I live in a world and have for years of, the left wanting me to blow up the right and the right wanting me to blow up the left. And it, it seems to me that if we just start at a point of saying, let's just sit down, maybe over a meal, and ultimately find that we have something in common, and from there you can, even if it's this much, mm -hmm. you can make progress in building. The two of you obviously live in that, in that world and that somewhat rarefied air, we are better served because you do. We thank you for your insight this afternoon, Representative Ross, Senator Batch. Uh, in full disclosure, I used to work with Senator Batch's dad, and I didn't know it until she reminded me because she was about that tall <laughs> in those days. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you both. Thank you for your dedication, audience, please. Thank you.